Okay, here we are uh, ready to start Chapter 3. Um, chap there's a lot in Chapter 3. I, uh, as I mentioned in the previous recording, I don't necessarily agree with the way everything is framed. There's a lot of stuff that we're going to get to uh, in other areas, um, but there's there's good stuff in here, and so I don't want to um, I, I, I don't want to skip over most of it. But I'm going to drill down uh, more on the analysis that's done through uh, financial statements. But I'm going to do a high level overview of of almost all the chapter, we're going to skip over the um, the investments pieces, including risk tolerance, because we're going to get to that when we get to the chapter that's on investments. So in general, in the approach to financial planning, I know that you've heard this before in the previous chapters, but the client and the planner need to mutually define um, the scope of the engagement. Uh, and then the planner um, helps helps the client solidify and articulate in a way that's meaningful the goals and objectives that are meaningful uh, to them. Those goals uh, can, you know, can start off with just examining values and dreams and things they'd like to do. And then we talk about prioritization. Um, and, and and get into some maybe some fairly deep conversations, um, but we end up quantifying how much certain things cost, um, and then uh, so we we want to put a in order to make something an actionable financial goal, we need to put a time frame and a dollar amount on it. So that's what we're that's what we'll end up getting to, and and some people may call that the difference between a goal and an objective, or a dream and a goal. I think that objectives are, uh, I guess, clearly more uh, m more definite than goals. So we can use that terminology, but just understand that there's no clear definition where one one term ends and the other term begins. Um, it is important that we do get to know our clients, so we need to understand about um, their values and attitudes. We need to know about their experiences with money and how they grew up. Um, we need to understand about what their expectations are, and, and so we need to talk with, with them about how they've worked with with other um, clients. We gather that sort of qualitative data, we and we get the quantitative data, and we take that quantitative data and we put together the financial statements. And so we get we want to come up with a clear picture and then analyze that picture of where the client currently is. And then what we do is we perform some analysis of how um, of of how the client may be able to achieve their goals. So that's largely what that um, what this chapter tends to be about. We're going to focus uh, a little bit more in depth on the financial statement analysis. Uh, pick, uh, analyzing the picture where the client currently is, but we're going to talk about the other areas as well. So uh, this is this language sort of that I, I'm, I'm a little hesitant about. I don't think that these are separate approaches to financial planning. I think we need to understand in general, in terms of having expectations, that clients in certain phases of the life cycle, we might need to press them to make sure that they have particular needs, you know, people who are who are married have different needs than people who are single. People who have children have different needs than people who don't have children. People who are um, at different points of their career in phases of the life cycle tend to have needs that transition over time, and there are some commonalities. But we don't necessarily want to prejudge that. We just want to make sure that we ask the right questions and ask in a, in, in, in a broad area. So there's some things that, and we'll, we'll, we'll look at what the, this um, chapter has to say about the life cycle. And I think it can be informative, but I don't think we want to necessarily jump to any conclusions about what our client needs. We want to ask the right questions and start on a broad approach. The pie chart approach is really just is is, is not an approach at all. Um, it's just a way of of presenting visually um, the same information that we might have in, in in a financial statement. 
in a way that's meaningful to our clients. So we might want to present things in a couple of different ways. Some people might look at numbers and read charts, uh, read tables better. Some other people might be be more visual and want to see things in a pie chart manner. So I think if we can present things in a couple of different ways, then that's good. Um, and we often will use pie charts to present to, to present ratios. We'll get to the uh, two-step, three-panel approach, uh, and I'll compare that to often it's something that's known as the pyramid approach, and this is just a method of going about presenting and framing um, the, the general method for our clients, what's important to take care of. So we broke, break that down into three different areas and we can use either panels to do that or a pyramid to do that and I'll, and, and I'll show you a little bit more about that. But it's again, it's about framing and communicating the same sorts of things that we would do whether we use that approach or not. Um, and then the present value of all goals approach. I would say um, this is this is something that is that is done more heavily and relied on more heavily um, in some financial uh, by some practitioners than others. Um, but to some extent, we all use the present value approach, where we figure out how much our clients or goals are going to cost in the future, and we figure out, okay, how much how much is it going to cost us? What's the present value, assuming some rate of return that we're going to need to save in order to get that goal, and we want to make sure that that goal is funded, and we figure out how much the client needs to save. Well, that's those are time value of money things, and, and we certainly spend a lot of time in this program teaching you time value of money and the applications, and that's in, 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 in financial planning. Whether or not we frame a present value as some sort of liability that needs to be paid off or not is a different matter. Um, and then there are different metrics which can be can, can be applied. Uh, that again is just a means of reporting uh, risk tolerance and asset allocation. I would just say that that belongs in a different chapter. And then we can talk about cash flow planning and gold planning, which are the bottom two, uh, which are the bottom two things. And 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 those are really. Um, different ways that different software and analytical packages work and it's about how they treat cash flows. We want to we, we have to pay attention to cash flow no matter what and we have to pay attention to our clients' goals and frame those goals uh, no matter what. So those are things that I think aren't really philosophically very different. I would just argue that they're mechanically different in how software uh, treats um, excess cash flows. Um, so here's some common get, getting into the uh, life cycle uh, thing first. So we want to break down people by certain age bracket profiles, whether they're single or married, whether they have kids or not. And we say, okay, generally what we'll see is that, you know, income will follow a pattern of where it rises fairly steeply until you get to be, you know, maybe uh, maybe about mid-career and then it maybe sort of plateaus off. Uh, and maybe even starts to go down a little bit until people ultimately retire. Hopefully, net worth, net worth isn't going to start off low and maybe even negative for people who have student loans. Uh, and then, and then it's going to increase. And it's the assets in different categories are going to increase at different rates, and we're going to get to a peak at about the time that we retire, and we can talk about how that may not necessarily may continue to grow for some period after we retire, but for the most part, we want to save until we retire, and then we spend down our savings. Same thing, those are the life cycle factors of, of assets. Um, and, and and where people are, they have people have different insurance needs uh, and different goals uh, during during those during those periods of the life cycle. Those are some commonalities. So again, like I said, we don't want to prejudge uh, prejudge the situation uh, based upon our clients. When we have somebody who is relying on us economically, uh, then we have great we certainly have greater insurance needs, but uh, to, to the extent that clients, how they might want um, their dependents taken care of if they're not there or how the survivor may react uh, if they're not there uh, is different and different for every client. So we don't want to necessarily prejudge that situation. We also don't want to prejudge our client goals. If clients have children 
it's not necessarily the goal of people who even if they even if they have the means to save and fund and send their kids you know all expenses paid to any college in the world that they want to go to or in it, or maybe they want their children to, to to fund their education because they believe in the value of paying for it themselves so that's something again we want to let our clients tell us what their goals are we definitely want to make sure to to touch and probe on those things but we don't want to do it in a way that's prejudging um, what our clients values are so uh, these are the things that we'll consider I think this, there's no new information on this slide um, and so we can see that you know accumulation um, typically tends to go from the 20s to the 50s. It'll be different for different people. There's overlap in terms of conservation of risk management. And then people's uh, distribution and gifting phase, typically distribution starts after uh, people retire, but gifts may start, you know, when they start to be a little bit heavier when they have grandchildren, which may be before they retire. But it depends upon the client-specific situation. So. Anyway, here's some commons, risks, and goals that we can frame for people in various ages um, of, 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 of the life cycle, but we should do planning on an individual basis. Again, the pie chart approach is really, um, is, is, is really just visually showing clients maybe where their cash flow is going here as an example. So we can see that, you know, uh, cl this, these clients right here are spending um, taxes and housing costs are 50 percent, you know, com coming off the top. So, you know, these, and we can see where, you know, where our client's money is going. And, and this may speak to someone a little bit more than uh, doing the subcategories on the income and expense statement or the statement of cash flows. So we might show them both. So um, you can figure out how to do a pie chart based upon, based upon percentages. You could do a pie chart based upon uh, dollar, dollar amounts, um, things like that. We can see here, here are some targeted benchmarks. Again, um, we don't want to prejudge this. People who live in New York City tend to spend a larger portion of their income on housing because that's that's what's requir required. They may sp spend less on transportation uh, because maybe they only have one car or zero cars in a family, things like that. Um, they, as a percentage of income, they may spend less on food in New York City than uh, than people do, or they may spend more if they like to go out to dine at fine restaurants. But you know, it it, it depends upon where people live and, um, and 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 what it is for them. But clearly, we can talk about hey, if things that can be a problem, if people are spending too much uh, on housing and other fixed expenses that gives them fairly little flexibility and they may need to consider some structural changes um, if they have fixed expenditures that are that are uh, too high going out. We can also apply the pie charts um, to, to balance sheets um, as well uh, or with with assets, I think I think it makes sense lots of times in assets to show pie charts, and we can say because okay we have maybe clients have too much in personal use assets relative to their investment assets, so again these will change potentially over the life cycle, um, and so we would think that personal use assets would be very high early on when people buy when people first buy their houses they've got lots of debt on them but the house is still worth um, a lot of money but they haven't had a, a lot of time to save their investment assets but as people get closer to retirement you know the hopefully their investment assets and they're continuing to save and those their investment assets will continue to grow and they'll be a lot larger than their personal use assets so it depends upon where people are in, in the life cycle and relative to, the, to what their goals are so here are benchmarks uh, by age. I'll let you take a look at that. We can see that um, you know cash and cash equivalents um, 
may be fairly constant uh, going throughout. I would say they may actually be higher earlier on. Investment assets is what we would uh, we would estimate would be something that should increase significantly as a portion of total assets. And then liabilities uh, we would expect would go down as our income uh, as the remaining portion of our income earning years goes down as well. Um, So basic four types of ratios, liquidity ratios, debt ratios, their ratios for financial security, uh, and then their performance ratios. So here's the emergency fund ratio, uh, cash and cash equivalent. So we'll say money that is in bank and savings accounts that's accessible, um, you know, short ter shorter term CDs, uh, money market accounts, savings accounts. We're probably not going to count money in a checking account uh, unless we have excess reserves in there. So we're not going to count money that is part of our monthly cash flow. Hey, I happen to have $4,000 in my checking account right now because it's the beginning of the month, but by the end of the month, I'll be down to $300 before I get my paycheck again. So that, if, if that's the way I'm managing it, then, then I'm not going to count that that balance, I'm going to count the money that is sort of set aside and not part of my monthly expenditures. So that's that, that's in the top line. The other cash equivalents that are potentially part of the top line, cash that I have, cash that I have access to. It could be cash value in a life insurance policy. I probably don't want to count my ability to borrow against my 401k. Uh, because if I lose my job, I have to repay that loan, so I probably don't want that. I might, may or may not want to count um, the ability to access cash out of home equity, which can be called away if the market turns down or may be difficult for me to repay um, if I lose my job. So I may or may not, so we can, th that's, um, that's debatable. Um, but those are the things that, that, that I'm going to want to count. Monthly uh, non-discretionary um, cash flows. Um, so again, this term non-discretionary is, is key. So we're not, certainly non-discretionary would be things that are fixed expenditures. My debt payments, my insurance premium payments, those fixed, fixed flows that go out. But they're going to be including at least some portion of my variable flows. I mean, look, if, if, if I'm unemployed, I may not keep the air conditioner as high or the heat in the summer or the heat as high in the winter, but I'm still, but I also have children and I'm not going to, I'm not going to burn them up or, 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 or make them freeze to death. Uh, my food uh, is certainly variable. Uh, and I can make that go toward a lower end, but a certain amount of that is not discretionary. My children's tuition for school um, is is not discretionary, um, at least at least not in the short run. In the long run, I would do that. But if if I'm sending my kids, I'm, they're my kids are in preschool now. But if I've got them in private school, um, you know that that would not be something that I necessarily uh, want to make a change just because I'm between jobs that I'm pulling my kids and making them change schools. So um, it, the point is that we need to consider what what the clients are likely to do. I may defer, clients may defer uh, taking their vacations until until they're employed, but they may not. They may reduce some of their spending, but not others. But you need to have that conversation in order to get to what is the monthly discretionary uh, cash flows. Now, the other thing that I have a problem with, and, and, and I think in general the benchmarks that are presented, I really don't want you to memorize those. I think it's good to compare it sometimes to benchmarks. But here's the, you know, sort of a benchmarks, another term of those is this is a rule of thumb. And when we do planning just by rules of thumb, um, for financial planners, I want to break your thumbs because you're supposed to do planning that is not what people in general should do, but what your client specifically should do. So for you may be doing clients for professors that are tenured, and let's say you have clients that are married, both of them are tenured professors, so they have very high stable income, very high, I mean, uh, I mean, very high job security, stable income, 
uh, they basically are almost unfireable. Their paychecks are the same amount uh, every month. You have two people working um, in, in the household with similar incomes. And so those people might have a very low need for emergency funds. I mean, they, they might only need a couple of months, and those are for things that, you know, they're not planning for, like a roof or something like that. It's not for long-term, uh, you know, long-term unemployment generally. So they may have a, a pretty low need for that versus someone who has a, uh, pretty high fixed expenses. Maybe they've got large uh, debt obligations, variable um, variable income that goes up and down depending upon cycles, um, and that work in an industry that where where they could be on, unemployed for very long periods of time in a you know family with multiple children but has only one income earner, those are things that are going to make the need go up. So six months in that case, I would argue, would not even be, uh, would not even be close to adequate. I would say maybe for someone like that, we'd have to do some t talking about it, but, t but 12 months might be adequate. Now, there's a balancing act here between having an emergency fund um, that is, that, that, that's all in cash or not. If we have, if we're saving for our goals and we're saving, you know, in particular in after-tax investment accounts, having a bunch of money in cash, there's an opportunity cost, and we talked about this in the economics chapter, there's an opportunity cost to saving that money in cash. It gives us that secure feeling of security, but we're not getting um, the kind of return on it that that we'd like to be. Also, maybe having a that security blanket in cash makes me willing to take long-term investment risk that I otherwise wouldn't take if I didn't have that security blanket. You know, and this is this is a psychological thing. But for people who have several hundred thousand dollars invested, they may want to reduce, particularly in an after-tax investment account, they may want to reduce the amount that they have that's earmarked in cash. Um, because because of the opportunity cost. Also, people that have uh, very high revolving debt um, may want to consider that there's opportunity cost to have. You know, let's say you know, if they have, if you have um, twenty thousand dollars in um, in credit card debt, having thirty, you know that. That might, may take you two years to pay off. Having thirty thousand dollars in sitting in cash may not be the smartest move, and so there may need to be some things uh, that you can do to mitigate that, dip down below the cash, and then build that back up. So these rules, these rules of thumb, are not concrete. We want you to use your brains. Um, there's not definitive uh, answers on cash and cash equivalents. There's certain things that are better ideas to consider. There's not definitive answers on what is discretionary versus what is non-discretionary. We need to uh, consider that for our clients. And we need to look at our clients uh, uh, total picture as well. And we need to consider um, we need to consider the psychological benefits of having a cash reserve as well as 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 to what the drain on return as the opportunity cost. So those are things that I want you to think about. Emergency fund though is something that's very important that you're going to want to perform this analysis pretty much for all of your clients. Related to that would be a current ratio, cash and cash equivalents over liabilities that you're going to have to pay off over the next period of time. We won't get as much into that. I do want you to understand this. Um, and, and look, you're probably not going to do this for all of your clients. Um, you're probably going to do this analysis for, particularly for your clients who may be in situations that you consider house poor. Um, or considering buying a bigger, uh, you know, a, a, a bigger dream house where they could put themselves in a situation where they're house poor, it takes a lot of their, um, a lot of their income, which uh, gives them less flexibility to live their lifestyle and to fund their future goals. Then we might consider doing this, but it's important that you understand what the housing ratios are. Often, the housing ratio one or the basic one. Um, it's also referred to as the front end ratio, the housing ratio two, or the broad one is often referred to as the broad ratio, as the back end ratio. So I would like for you to understand that. And then these two at the bottom um, are debt to total assets and net worth to total assets. Those are going to tell us exactly the same thing. 
because assets minus liabilities equals uh, equals net worth, and assets minus net worth equals debt. So, um, so, so those are things, and we'll get into a little bit more about what those mean here. So, the housing ratio one, and you're going to be tested on this, and you're going to have to perform this, and you're going to have to know what the guideline is. These guidelines actually come as um, general rules and thumb from banks as what they will lend. Generally, again, depending upon the area of the country, it can be different. Generally, uh, you want to be below these. Um, and so this, lots of times banks wouldn't lend any more than that. Sometimes they will. But you want to be, you want, you want your clients to be below these numbers. So, uh, housing costs over gross pay. And what we're talking about is PITI, principal interest taxes insurance over gross monthly pay. So, um, so that is, Principal interest taxes and insurance. Lots of times, people will put maintenance in there as well. Um, in addition, the housing ratio too is really a total debt uh, ratio. So we take PITI, and then we add the other debt payments in. So this would be, you know, for you it would be student loans and maybe auto payments. Hopefully, you don't have a lot of other debts in that. We add our other debt payments in there, and that shouldn't be over. 36% of, group, uh, of gross pay. These are debt service ratios. So, um, so the front end or the back end are the housing one and housing two ratios. And mortgage lenders tend to look at both of those. Um, and then, so here's the uh, total debt to total assets ratio. Benchmark depending upon the client age. Um, and so the um, lots of people say, hey, they want to be debt free. Um, they they want to avoid debt, um, and that's fine. But when they when they pay down debt, there's an opportunity cost to paying down debt, which means you don't save as much, um, so you don't build assets as quickly. But if you pay down debt and you get debt pretty close to zero, your 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 debt to assets ratio what might be very low, but that might not necessarily be the best thing that you can do. Um, so. Um, so this is not a this is not a ratio that should be looked at as an absolute or as in a vacuum. So total debt to total assets. But we would ex expect that your assets, as you age, your debt will gradually decline, and your assets will will increase certainly. Um, in terms of what this ratio might look like, if it is greater than one hundred percent. That means that your debt is more than your assets. That is, is that a problem? Well, I think um, it depends. For somebody who's 65 years old, that is probably a big problem. Uh, for somebody who is your age, and you have stu and lots of you have student loans, I think having having debt that is greater than your assets, in other words, being balance sheet insolvent. Um, negative net worth, um, that's okay because you're investing in an asset that doesn't actually show up on the balance sheet or banks won't look at it, but in your, in your ability to earn an income. So we talked about that we think that this means that as long as you manage your resources well, you're going to earn higher income than you would have otherwise by having a college degree and being wise in the major that you choose. Net worth to total assets, this really shows us uh, basically the same thing. If our uh, net worth, is, if we have no debt, our net worth to our total assets is, is, is going to be 100%. Um, so if we, have, um, if we have pretty high leverage, so if we have, um, for example, I borrowed, um, money recently to buy a house. So I put 20% down. My uh, my net worth to my total assets, you know, just looking at my house is only 20%. Um, so, you know, I, I add in some other things, then it'll, then, then it'll increase. But then, so, um, 
so those are the things that, that we need to consider. This basically tells us the same information that this ratio does because of the relationship between net worth and total debt and total assets, assets, liabilities, and net worth. So ratio is important for financial security. Um, I would say that the, um, the most important one is the savings rate. Um, and so we want to consider employer matches, uh, particularly if they offer an employer match, and we always want our clients to take advantage of that. Um, and the benchmark depends upon how, um, when the client started saving, how far they are from retirement, and how many assets they have. So it depends upon client goals and, uh, um, so it depends upon client goals and how much they've saved so far. Uh, in time and, and their time frame. So here's some examples uh, for people who are 40 years away from retirement. Yeah, a ballpark bench, benchmark again. Rules of thumb are no good. I think you should do this calculation individually for every client. But somewhere in the neighborhood of 12 to 13 percent for people who start saving 30 years before retirement, depending upon what, see this wage replacement ratio is just thrown in there. If you want a higher or lower wage replacement ratio, this will affect things, and your risk tolerance will affect things as well. So um, saving 20% uh, might be more appropriate, or people who wait until about 20 years for retirement maybe need to save as much as a third of what their gross pay is. So. Um, that's an important, and we'll, we'll get into that uh, at the important the value uh, of money and the importance of compounding uh, in future chapters. Um, investment assets to gross pay as well. This is a multiple, and I think um, that that this is something that people start to look at more when they as they as they age. Um, you know, having. Hey, if you if if you make forty thousand dollars a year when you graduate, you're you're not gonna it'd be saying, hey, I've got twenty thousand dollars half a year of income. What ends up happening as you as you get into your fifties, though, you're gonna care a lot, and you go, okay, I have ten times my salary. In your sixties, you might say, I want to have twenty times, you know, fifteen or twenty times my salary. And so, by the time you retire, you might want to have somewhere between twenty and thirty times. Uh, 20, 20 and 30 times your salary, depending upon what your goals are and the rate of replacement ratio is. So, but in order to get there, it means that we have to start at an early age. So, that's why this benchmark, the multiple of your income that you should have um, as you retire, is, um, is 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 age dependent. So here's some benchmarks. Uh, again, it depends upon what the client goals and their time horizon are, but these are some generally useful benchmarks. Depends upon what their wage replacement ratio is, um, certainly for that. Um, these are basically the return, um, the return thing, um, things. This is these are basically all. Just variations of the growth formula. What do I have? What do I have at the end of the period versus what I have at the end uh, at the end of the period? Take out take out my savings, and then over what I had at the beginning as the beginning of the period. So this is return on investments. Return on assets is is calculated the same way, and return on net worth would be calculated the same way. I would think that my return on asset my return on investments. Um, things that are expected to maybe have a, a higher rate of return, maybe eight, nine, ten percent a year, on average, would be higher expected than my return on assets. My return on net worth. So then, let's say, if I have, particularly if I have a lot of money in depreciating assets or lifestyle assets, so return on assets is going to be higher if I have more investment assets, I think, than I have use use assets. So putting those concepts from, from earlier together. Also, uh, return on net worth. My return on net worth, as long as, as I'm investing in things that are, are going, going up, not depreciating, as long as I buy those, so even use assets like a house, um, as long as I do that, actually the higher debt that I have, 
the higher my return on net worth is going to be because I'm using leverage to multiply my return on net worth. I'll give you an example. So let's say that my I said a house I put down 20%. Let's say my house costs $250,000. I put $50,000 down, and so I have 20% 20, 20 equity. So my asset returns, let's say the $250,000, I'll rather than uh, rather than just do that. So I said my ass, my house was worth 250,000. That's the assets value, um, and my equity or my net worth that's in my house is 50,000. So let's say that now my house, um, because I owe 200,000. So now let's say that my house uh, increases by 10%. So my asset increased by 10%. So now my house is worth $275,000. And so if I still owe 200000 Now I my um, my my net worth in my house. It just look, let's say that that's all I owned was a house. My net worth went from fifty to seventy-five. So because I had leverage uh, on that, my eighty percent leverage, eighty percent borrowed, eighty percent. My return on my return on assets was. So I take. This minus this divided by this, and these are going to be in percentages, and this one equals what I have at the end minus what I had at the beginning. Again, just the standard growth formula divided by what I had at the beginning. So I've got a 50% return on net worth versus only a 10% return on assets. So, but if things had gone down in value, my return on my my net worth would go down. So. Leverage can work in your favor, and it can work, and, and it can work against you as well. So, very important study slide here for for, for these next two. Again, the important ones: uh, emergency funds, um, and I would say um, the emergency fund ratio is probably the most important one here on this page. Um, I do want you to understand what these other ones are, and you'll definitely be tested on the housing ratios one and two. Um, and then I'll definitely test you in general on the savings rate and the multiple uh, of investment assets to gross pay, um, and I probably will general generally testing on the growth formula. Is, is fair game, but not anything specific about ROI, ROA, or return on net worth that you need to that you need to know other than just how to do the basic math. So here's an example. Uh, I don't think it's particularly instructive. Um, we can see that we could use pie charts to do the balance sheet, um, income statement pie chart. Here's an example of the emergent of the emergency fund ratio. So if I take my if I have my month if I have annual expenses, I need to divide them by 12. So here I've got ordinary living expenses. So I might say, okay, that might include okay, I can trim my food budget, but this is what my annual ordinary living expenses. I, I'm going to spend, you know a little over $2,000 a month. My total debt payments, that's fixed. That definitely has to be in there. My insurance payments are fixed. Those have to be in there. Tuition payments, those are fixed. Now, if those are due at one particular time, I should probably have those in a separate account. Um, 
and so that might that may or may not be part of it, right? But if I'm paying on a monthly basis where it's coming out, I'll probably include that in this ratio. Uh, property tax res, uh, residence. So if if that's not part of my mortgage payment and I've got to pay that tax, now again, if I pay it once a year, I probably am going to want to have that. Um, if I pay this once a year, I'm probably going to want to have that in a separate account. Charitable contributions. It depends. I may tighten the belt on some charitable contributions, um, but if it's something that's where I've got a, a, an organization that's relying on me on a monthly basis, I might not feel like uh, doing that. It might be embarrassing if I had to cut back. So that might be something that's not uh, that, that, that's non-discretionary. You've got to have that conversation with your client. So. Figuring those things out, and then we total it up, $66,000 a year divided by 12. And we probably are going to want to use round numbers, too, um, it, um, particularly when we get to the end. I don't mean adding these things up, but we want to get use a round number and say, okay, we're going to round up, and then we're going to divide, divide by 12 if we looked at things on an annual basis. So here are the debt ratios again. Uh, another uh, another good uh, study slide you can look at using the case uh, that we just did. Um, you, I'll, I'll let you do that. We'll probably do an exercise in class where you figure out these ratios as well, and you may be asked to calculate this per case on a test. Um, savings rate. Okay, so here's the two-step approach that I talked to you about. So panel one, we look at uh, risk management. Um, step two is short-term savings, uh, and then step three is 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 our long-term term savings. A lot of financial uh, financial advisors historically have gone use something called the pyramid pr approach, where they do asset protection. Uh, and then they do their cash management, which is short-term short-term savings, and then they do their long-term uh, long-term um, goals, uh, retirement income planning, and then they do you know, these things that are definitely the the most important to us, and then these things that would be nice to do, um, and, or you know things that we're willing to take some risk on, uh, but but are not as important as these other goals. So. This is a way that you could do this. This could be you could combine these two and then have these have this basically be a three-panel approach as well. So, um, just another way of looking at the same thing. I I probably won't test you on that. Um, so um, the metric ap approach. Um, I guess we could look at using benchmarks and ratios. Um, this is just um, this is something good, I think, um, to see what are some general rules of thumb for how much insurance people are going to want to have. I do want you to customize that uh, for your for your clients. So um, so th this is this is something that's good to study disability insurance. Generally, you can't get more than 67, 60 to 70 percent of gross pay. You'd like it to be after taxes if you can if you can help it, which means that your your premium should be paid with before tax dollars. Health insurance probably you want to have a lifetime benefits of at least I would say at least three million dollars, maybe even five million dollars. Life insurance um, it depends upon the goals and it depends upon the, the methods that you do. But as a general rule of thumb, you might be somewhere between 10 and 20 times uh, your, your, your insurance, but it depends upon how much you save. Long-term care insurance, homeowner's insurance, and, and auto insurance, you want full replacement value. Liability, you want to um, have good liability coverage, particularly on your auto insurance, maybe three hundred to five hundred thousand dollars worth of liability insurance on your auto, and at least a million dollars of liability insurance of people with higher net worth or that have targets on their backs that are known uh, for uh, for you know potentially being sued um, ought to get personal uh, um, liability umbrella policy. Um, again, we'll we'll talk about more of these things when we get into the um, 
into the risk management section, which we'll cover on the second test. But this is something that's a generally uh, that, that's a pretty good uh, rule, rule of thumb. You can take this and use it as study material for the second exam. Again, some more uh, so, some more rules of thumb. I think that these aren't particularly good ones. Um, I'm not going to talk about risk tolerance uh, in this chapter and asset allocation. We'll talk about that in the future. And then, okay, present value of all goals. Um, so it takes each short, intermediate, and long-term goal, determines the present value of that goal, and then subtracts how much we have saved uh, toward those goals, and then comes up with the net amount that we have uh, as shortfall is an obligation to be retired. It's almost treated like a, bill, a liability over the remaining life. We don't necessarily call it a liability, but we, in essence, are doing that. We're doing amortization to figure out how much do we need to save each year. And so that's definitely part of the time value of money, and we use that. We do it with calculators. We do it in Excel. And it's implicit in all goal planning in, um, in that, that happens in financial planning software as well. Um, so we could actually formally break down a, a, a present value of the unfunded liability, or we could just say, here's how much you have, how much do we need to save, and solve for payment. That's basically the same thing as what we're doing. You could formalize it and report it this way, which I know some financial planners who do that, um, and I just want you to know that's an approach. I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to test you on that, the particulars of doing a calculation on that approach, but I just do want you to know what it is. Um, so here's some examples of insurance recommendations. Any insurance recommendation, any estate planning recommendation, any recommendation that you give your client, you should uh, pay attention to what the impact on cash flows is going to be because you have to say, this is what you're currently doing and this is what we recommend that you're doing because you've got to make sure that they can afford to implement your rec uh, recommendations. Um, <clears throat> so... Debt management uh, is something that's uh, particularly important. We want to have debt service that is that is not too high relative to our income, and that can be retired um, over a period that is that is relative both to the useful life of the asset and the and, and the useful life and the and, and our work and our expected work work life as well. Um, Strategic approach, um, where we talk about setting goals for our clients, we're always going to be uh, setting goals and we're going to figure out some prioritization. Certainly meeting basic living expenses is more important than taking the fanciest uh, vacation because we certainly, you know, taking nice vacations is good, but we're not going to do that if it would, if it would make us homeless. Um, so we could talk about doing a specific mission statement, but we, whether we do that or not, we want to get a good, uh, I, a good handle on what our clients' values and and how they prioritize their goals and how, you know, relative to each other. Um, the objectives of financial planning: we want risk management, cash management, debt management. Um, we also always want to pay attention to um, to taxes as it's part of cash management, but also taxes permeate all the other areas of planning, um, including investments and including, uh, including insurance and including estate and gifting strategies as well. Um, and then certainly we look at savings and investments, which is part of cash management. Okay. So um, high-level overview, what are the most important things uh, in this chapter? Um, I think I 
kind of went over quickly the things that, that I thought uh, were the most important um, for this chapter. I definitely want you to look at, at the emergency funds, the housing one and housing two ratios, be able to calculate uh, and understand what the other ratios are and what they mean, understand that the savings rate is, is something that's important. Um, let's see what else. Um, understand um, how rules of thumb are useful and, 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 and why you might not want to rely on those, how different benchmarks may change across the life cycle and depending upon what the client's uh, situation is. Um, and those are the most important things in this chapter. I didn't want to touch on. Um, I didn't want to touch on just uh, on, on everything because I think it's. Uh, I owe it to you, but I'm going to touch. I'm going to primarily test you on the things that I said. Just said that were that, that are the most important. And I want you to understand. I want you to be able to look at a particular financial statement. And we'll do some th some examples of this in class where you do a financial statement and then you are able to cal calculate ratios based upon that. Okay, that does it for Chapter 3.